was the full reconstruction of the allowing to be completely broken. That was a fun couple of weeks. <laughs> so, on the subject of the Wii, since that's really what we have the most experience with or are most known for, um, Wii's been out for about three years. It's been three years since we demonstrated that unsigned code execution. In that time, Nintendo has released nine firmware updates, and of all those updates, eight of them were contrived. Only one of them had an actual real feature that somebody would want, namely the ability to run uh, games off of an SD card. Every single other feature was background improvements to improve system performance, which really was their code for patching vulnerabilities. Um, according to VG charts, that they sold about 73 million consoles, which I think is the highest of all the consoles, I'm correct. And uh, of those, we estimate that about 30 million of them were produced before they fixed the bug uh, where the hash comparison bug that we had disclosed. Um, and so these people were fortunate enough to be able to run Boot Me, our alternate bootloader that we ran, uh, wrote for the Wii. Uh, we actually ended up putting a lot of time into that because one of the biggest challenges for us hacking on the Wii was not really the protection, but really the fragility of the thing. The software is very, very fragile, and there are very, very, very many ways to accidentally brick the device and no way to fix it. So we put time into making something that would simply let you unbrick your Wii. Um, and, you know, as of, uh, I believe, since, since September of this year, uh, we are proud to announce we have one million unique users of the Homebrew channel. So that's over 1% of all users of all owners of Wii's have installed our Homebrew channel. So that was a... <laughs> so I'd say we had a pretty good run. <laughs> so let's take a look at what consoles we have here. So there's first the Wii, which was released at the end of 2006. Then the Xbox 360, was, which was released about a year earlier, and the PS3 was released at about the same time like the Xbox, and like the Wii. And so the Wii was pretty much broken from the beginning because they were like drive chips, which allowed pirated games to be run, and um, GameCube homebrew. And then after a year, it was like fully broken, and Nintendo tried to fix it again and again, but well, they failed. So in the end, it's just broken, and it's still broken, and it probably will be broken. So then we have the Xbox 360. It has a really good security system, and there were only like two major hacks, which was the King Kong hack, which was demonstrated, I think, two years ago, or three years, and then the JTAG hack. But those were minor bugs, and Microsoft was just able to fix them. So, okay, the drives are completely hacked, so we could also mark the whole thing here in red and in blood, but, um, well, we don't care about piracy. It does not allow homebrew code, and. We don't care about running code others wrote. We want to run our own code. So, and then there's finally the PS3. So, the difference here is that the PS3 originally supported Linux. So, no one really cared other than, other than one single thing where you cannot re really use the 3D features on Linux. So, they found some way to get around that. Sony pushed a firmware update because they didn't want that and they fixed it. So, well, but still nothing happened. But then Sony decided to release the Slim. So they claimed they don't want Linux or they, they're not going to support Linux because they want to save money. Well, today we know that this is bullshit because Linux just runs on the Slim without any huge code modif modifications. So it was just something they claimed to do, but it's, not, it's certainly not true. <coughs> and after that, people actually started to care. And a few months later, GeoHot tried to break the hypervisor, which is going to ex be explained later and Sony's reaction was to remove Linux, and then finally the jailbreak happened, and yeah, in the end we're going to present some new hacks, and the PlayStation 3 is likely going to look like the Wii afterwards. So, hi, my name is Michael Style, and I'm not actually part of those guys, but um, if you remember, there's been um, an, a console hacking talk for um, the, at, at least the last eight years, every year, and um, every once in a while, I get a cameo in one of these talks because I look at the big picture, at the statistics about what's going on in the hacking space, and it's always the same thing I want to say, which is Linux is inevitable. Um, either you support Linux on your hardware, or it will be hacked, so it'll run sooner or later. <laughs> Correlation is not causation, but I have some good statistics to back that up. So if you look at the devices, so this, this is the slide that I gave, um, that I presented three years ago um, in another one of these talks um, with 
these are, were the systems that were available at that time and the years when they came out. Um, the, how good the security system was, so darker, darker red colors means very good, very sophisticated, very complicated security system. And as time progressed, it got better, but the smaller systems still had weaker security systems because it just wasn't that easy to implement them in smaller, in smaller space. This column shows you how long it took to have these systems hacked. And yeah, there's some correlation between a complicated security system and hacking the system. And the question is, why d did it get hacked? And the statistics clearly show here that, except for the first one, the PlayStation, a very long time ago, all of them were always done for the sole purpose of running homebrew software, running Linux, just running your own code because you own the hardware. And there has always been that side effect of, well, if you open it, if you can run anything on it, you can run pirated games on it because the keys have leaked or the whole DRM system is just not in place anymore. But there's one here that is special. No, wait, let, let me first update the slide. So the iPad, same thing as the iPhone. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's look at the PlayStation 3. This one is special because, well, the security system looks like it's kind of sophisticated and as of, well, three years ago and even a year ago, it, it was not hacked. But so this, this has changed. So now after, after four years, it has finally been hacked. And you could say it's, it's got hacked for piracy, homebrew. Um, I let those guys decide and argue on that. Um, and of course, there's always the side effect. So piracy is possible or was possible, whatever. But you could also look at it from another perspective, which is um, if, if, you, if you just assume that PlayStation that we had in that list was the old PlayStation where Linux was possible, and that was the whole reason, as I argue, that it never got hacked. It ran Linux already, it didn't get hacked. Never. So now, let's update this for how long did it take un from the point when the system was closed until it got hacked. And then we have just 12 months here, which is pr pretty much the same as the Xbox 360 uh, with, a, with a similar security system anyway. Okay, thanks. Okay, so before we're going to talk about how we can break the security system, we have to talk about how the PS3 actually works. So what Sony did was to ask IBM for their cell processor, which is called the Cell Broadband Engine, and they put it in there. So this is essentially just a 64-bit power PC, and they have like, which is on the bottom left there, and they have like eight SPEs or SPUs. That's synergistic processing element. It's just a fancy name for a vector processor. So each of those things has like 265 kilobyte of memory. Well, had, uh, of memory, um, this memory can, uh, well, it cannot access the rest of the memory. It can, it can just DMA from and to it. And so they can use this for security because there is this, this special mode. So at the bottom you see the local storage. It's um, usually you have like the whole thing is available from the power PC, you can just read it, you can write to it, you can even stop the SPUs and look what they are doing. You can even write a debugger on the power PC to like totally inspect what's in every single register. However, when isolation mode is enabled, an authenticated binary is loaded, decrypted and verified by hardware and the local storage gets closed down, all the, debug feature, all the debug features are disabled, so the only thing you see is the pirate marked in green there, which is like a small area used for, com for, used for communication with the power PC, and the red area is blocked and only accessible from the SPU itself. So Sony can use this for, to like hide things or implement some stuff they don't want us to see. So then we have, um, how code running there? We have the hypervisor at the top, which just, which can virtualize multiple logic partitions, and usually the only thing running there is level two or game OS, which is like some kind of kernel that provides support features for games and so on. And games itself are running in problem state, which is the PowerPC user mode. And level two and level one can communicate with the SPU in isolation mode usually. What usually happens, or what Sony does, is that game OS uh, calls level one with some hyper call tells it to like load the SPU, load some loader on there and let it decrypt stuff. But GameOS itself can do this as well. So, and now we're going to talk a bit about the boot process. So what were we first, 
Okay, that's actually wrong. It's actually a bootloader here. Well, yeah, so bootloader essentially loads level zero, which is some PowerPC code running in hypervisor mode. The sole purpose of this code is to bring up the PowerPC, um, bring up another SPU to load medloader, which then loads level one loader. So those are just isolated binaries used for like loading more stuff. And finally, level one gets loaded here. And yeah, just continues with loading another SPU, loading medloader again, and loading level two loader. So what medloader just does, it decrypts level two loader, then level two loader decrypts level, finally level two, which is then, then running in um, kernel mode on the PS3. So red is SPE and blue is PowerPC. So the, yes. the two CPUs kind of interleave their, their, call, their code. Yeah. All right, so um, let's look at the security systems of the different consoles. Uh, each, there's a whole bunch of features that uh, consoles can share in their security systems. So let's compare them. So uh, the first security feature that uh, everyone puts on is a hidden boot ROM that can do something special. Uh, it was implemented in the Xbox One in the uh, Southbridge chip, and every console after that has put it uh, in the CPU, which um, is uh, very nice because you can't easily read it, and obviously you can't override it with a mod chip. So you pretty much need that. Um, after that, uh, of course, uh, people use public key cryptography to authenticate the code that runs on consoles. So um, both the Wii and the 360 uh, have that. And why am I talking? Oh, maybe the next slide. Yeah. So, that, so yeah. No, I was looking at the next slide. Okay. So all of the uh, four consoles have that. And uh, the Wii and the 360 also have on die key storage, um, which uh, hides uh, keys uh, so that you can't easily read them from external memory or anything like that. PS3 kind of has that, but it uh, doesn't work very well. Uh, since we have public key crypto, uh, of course, you want to keep that chain of uh, signed and verified code running from boot, so you need a chain of trust. The Xbox 360 and the PS3 do that. The Wii tries to do that, but uh, they only verify installed code at install time, so that kind of breaks the chain of trust. That's why it doesn't get that uh, point there. Uh, the Wii, the 360, and the PS3 also have for console keys. Uh, the Xbox One did not have that. Uh, so these keys can be used to encrypt uh, things like internal code and um, tickets and things like that. Uh, to be unique to one console. Uh, the Xbox One, the 360, and the PS3 have signed executables. Uh, the Wii doesn't sign executables, it kind of uh, signs packages. So it's an outer layer. Uh, with signed executables, of course, you, of course, you ensure that, um, that uh, any code that you run on the system is authenticated before running it. Uh, the, Wii and the, three, um, the Wii and the PS3 also have a coprocessor. You saw the secure SP on the PS3. And the Wii has what we call the Starlet, which also runs all the security code. So um, this helps isolate the security subsystem from the rest of the code and you know, prevent uh, exploits from sort of leaking into the security stuff. The Wii does something that's really interesting, which is it fully encrypts and signs an entire disk image. So you can't touch any single resource file in a game. It uses a hash tree, which is a clever construction, and it effectively signs and verifies the entire thing as you uh, read it from the disk, so you can't change anything. The Wii and the PS3 also have encrypted storage. The hard drive on the PS3 and the flash memory on the Wii are both encrypted with a per console key, and uh, so that way you can't easily read it from the outside and figure out what's going on inside the, uh, the internal storage memory of the consoles. The Wii, however, also signs that uh, code with, um, with an HMAC signature so that uh, you can't patch stuff into that storage, even if you can decrypt it somehow, without knowing a key that's particular to that console that lets you uh, uh, do that. So that's uh, quite interesting, too. Quite important, too, if you have encrypted storage.